I'll start while the stars come to the stage. Welcome, I'm Amy McDonald, Director of City Space. Robert, right here. A little reunion going on. We're delighted to celebrate and honor the Car Talk team and their legacy this evening. It was 44 years ago. Hey, you, hey, you guys, come on, no more laughing. Come on. Doug, you're in the middle. <laughs> Ray. <laughs> Car Talk debuted 44 years ago. <laughs> Within a decade, it became a national show on NPR, eventually reaching a weekly audience of more than 3 million listeners each week on 630 public radio Five stations. Million, who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> it transformed the public radio landscape, Can't trust the introducing, with these <laughs> introducing comedy to the NPR airwaves. Well. <laughs> <laughs> As a young producer, Keeler was APR. <laughs> one, show, one of these shows is not like the others. Yeah. As a young producer, many years ago, we all looked forward to when Car Talk came in because they got a catered lunch every week, and we got the leftovers. Well, that wasn't right off the bat. <laughs> hey, and that we'd like to hear about that. Legend has it that Ray and Tom every year put a perk in their contract and like the next year there was wine at the lunch which there was never any leftover right there was bagels it started with there bagels was, oh it yeah. started with see I, we want to hear about with, this started with there bagels. was the breakfast jerry remember jerry? <laughs> oh jerry yeah <laughs> and wasn't it like at the end wasn't we there a miss Seuss come in and give everyone no, shoulder no, rubs? no, no okay, there was okay. A okay. jerry who came in and made these very greasy breakfasts for us <laughs> we couldn't then, wait to get and then, <laughs> and then he had a heart attack <laughs> Not funny. Yeah. But that was it for him. Maybe we lost the break. All right, I better hurry up here. Okay. Uh, last month, Car Talk ended its remarkable radio run, but fans can still listen on the twice weekly Best of Car Talk Bad podcast, quoting The No Slave to Fashion, Bungo Boy, Subway Fugitive, Executive Producer, Doug Berman. Can we hear the, the origins of all these monikers, by the way? The popularity of the Car Talk podcast tells us that people want their bad car advice on demand now on their own <laughs> schedule. Moderating, moderating tonight's conversation with Doug and Ray is the former NPR All Things Considered host Robert Siegel, who is there from... Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> who is there from the beginning, and he's going to share with us how, who actually made the decision to get Car Talk on the NPR <laughs> airwaves. Um, a we few, have a half an hour. <laughs> a few <laughs> housekeeping notes. Uh, if you can keep your masks on while not eating or drinking, and keep your cell phone, to take your, uh, put your cell phones off, uh, turn them to silent. And for everyone who has a premiere ticket, um, if they could just sit in their seats for about five minutes at the end of the show, much appreciated. Take it away, Ray. Robert. <laughs> Anybody. Yeah, no, we, can. we can cut out the middleman and go straight to Ray here. <laughs> uh, let, we, you know why Ray and Doug are here, and we also have uh, uh, several uh, former producers from, from Car Talk here. As to why I'm doing this, uh, that may not be entirely clear. So let me just uh, dispense quickly with my relationship to this, uh, to this program. Back, back in the 1980s, uh, I was uh, sentenced to four years of hard labor in, uh, in the ranks of NPR management. Uh, and I was the director of news and information programming uh, for that time. And after launching a program called Weekend Edition on Saturdays, there was demand in the, in the public radio system for Weekend Edition Sunday. Uh, and um, uh, we've started planning that program. Uh, Susan Stanberg was to be the host, which she was. Uh, Dan Shore would do a commentary. Uh, and uh, Susan said, you should, so Sunday you should do a puzzle. So we found a guy who edited Puzzles Magazine. We'd never heard of Puzzles. Uh, Will Shorts, who's now the New York Times crossword puzzle editor, has been doing it ever since. Uh, and that left another hour and a half or so that we'd have to figure out how to fill every single Sunday morning. Uh, and as I've said, that, uh, that sort of challenge can lower the bar a little bit as to what... Uh, what 
what you're willing to put on the air. Uh, the, the decision to put these two guys from WBUR on that program and expose them to the national audience, uh, it, it's like, um, if you know baseball, it's like Willie Mays' catch in the 1954 World Series when he runs back and he, he, he catches it over the shoulder, spins around and throws it in. The, the polo grounds where he did that held no more than 34,000 people, but at least 300,000 have claimed that they experienced that moment <laughs> uh, in the ballpark. Same thing with uh, putting uh, car talk on Weekend Edition Sunday. Uh, the executive producer, Jay Kernis, the uh, producer, Kitty Ferguson, the host, uh, Susan Stanberg, have all at various times claimed that they, uh, in the face of, uh, of everyone else's negative attitude, championed this, this program. I can tell you that as, the, as, as their boss in those days, uh, the first time that Joanne Wallace, who is uh, in charge of administrating, uh, administering NPR News, uh, told me about WBUR with a cassette, which many of you are old enough to remember what that, what that means, <laughs> uh, a set of a program with these two guys who do about car. My first hearing that there was a possibility of a show where two guys would do uh, auto repair uh, <laughs> answers was, that's even dumber than most of the other ideas that, that we're hearing from. Station and Joanne was wise enough to say very quietly, "Just listen to it." And I listened to it. Uh, half an hour later, I was absolutely sold. Uh, I heard something that I heard very rarely on NPR in those days, which was something side-splittingly funny uh, and smart. Uh, something funny at NPR usually meant something you thought somebody else might laugh at. Because if, if you if you all laughed at it, it had to violate several principles, some some policies we had about what you could. What you it had say. to be appealing. And that's right. It had to be appealing. Uh, but but here was this this remarkable program, and um, and we decided to make them part of of the first weekend edition. And a year later, they had their own show. Uh, it took that long, huh? Huh? It took. It took. You forgot to mention that when you made them part of it, they had to change the name to Weekend Edition. W E A K. <laughs> weekend weekend so, Edition. So, um, I, I don't know uh, uh, if I can say that um, uh, who, who exactly can take responsibility for that. Decision. Well, I heard a slightly different version. I of bet it, you did. Uh, I which bet involves you. Did. you. Yes. And, and the version I had heard is that you were on some kind of a hiatus driving through the Boston area. Uh, Doug, can back me up on this, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yes. I, and, I heard and, that bullshit, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you happened to be driving near BUR, and you yeah. had the public radio station on that you knew yeah. was right here, and, and we, sh who should be on, but me and Tom. Yeah. And you slammed on your brakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you said, oh, my God. God, these guys have to be on national public radio tomorrow. <laughs> no, that is, that's absolutely false. That's, that's, uh, uh, that's, 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 as with so many things, a great story. Yeah, yeah, it is a good story. But yeah. it just fails on that one, which reminds me. Well, I have a version of it that has Susan Stamberg doing it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I should say that when, it, when Car Talk became an NPR program, uh, here it had made, you, you guys had joined us through a news and information program. Yeah, well, that was a and uh, <laughs> would, and I wondered when they when they gave you your own show, would we would that still be a news and information show? Could we bend enough rules about what qualified uh, well, you know, news and this? misinformation, perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you became an arts and performance program. You were a cultural program. Oh yes, yeah, culture. Also were, a stretch. <laughs> 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 and, uh, uh, but I don't know very much about the pre NPR car talk and what you guys were doing before this. How, how, did this, how did this thing happen? How did this begin? Well, the best of my recollection, uh, Tommy and I used to teach adult education classes at the garage. And, and uh, at the time, Tom was between wives, and he wanted to meet eligible young women. <laughs> and, and he thought it would be, be a good mechanism for doing that. So we, we taught these classes. Uh -huh. And I, I guess somebody who worked at BUR or had some influence here took one of those, you know, night classes. And next thing I know, we got a call that invited us to participate in a panel discussion. I guess five or six local shop owners had been invited to participate in this one-time thing. And I thought it was a stupid idea, so I said, it's right up Tommy's alley. So, <laughs> 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 so he went, and as luck would have it, he was the only one who showed up. 
<laughs> he was the entire panel. He was, the, he was the panel of expert. <laughs> <laughs> and the host, whose name I've forgotten. Uh, Dick Wheatman? That's it. Producer. He might, have, he might have been the producer. Yeah. Anyway, he asks Tom if he wants to do it. And, and uh, Tom said, what the heck? I'm getting out of work for a couple of hours. I might as well do something. And Tom asked, he said, can we take calls? You know, and, and they said, yeah, 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 sure. And uh, the next week, they, it went so well, they invited both of us back. <laughs> and in the intervening week, the fellow who had made the original invitation lost his job. <laughs> I don't know what the connection was, but, but, but he, uh, and he had left us a note, left us a, kind of left us a note that said, good luck, try to watch your language. <laughs> and for the most part, yeah. I think we did that. Yeah. You know, and then, of course, we, back in those days, we had seven-second delay. Remember the yeah, yeah. tape deck over here and another one over here? And the, the, <laughs> the engineer could dive from the board <laughs> to the thing and hit the button. But, uh, so that's basically how it, So, And then Dougie came along when, when, in fact, NPR invited us to do the show yeah. nationally because we needed a real producer. We didn't have a producer at that point. Tom and I yeah. just basically rambled for an hour. <laughs> and there were some shows which you'll probably get the benefit of hearing on the podcast, where we entertain like one or two callers yeah. the whole show. <laughs> you know, we found someone interesting. We said, well, you know, and we didn't have any constraints. Yeah. Did we, Doug? <laughs> Did Doug, we, Doug? Doug instituted, well, Doug instituted the five-minute rule when he became the producer. Well, we, the five-minute rule was... Talk to this schmuck for five minutes and move on. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. We were, the, we were, oh, we were the schmucks. I'm sorry. <laughs> Something like that. Um, the uh, people were calling in originally when it was a local show. We should say it when you. Oh yeah, when, yeah, yeah. When it the was, show was national. You you arranged the call and then and then connected with the people. That's right. Yeah. But originally, I mean, the first ten years, people just called. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to remember. We had the very first shows. We were in a very tiny little room with the engineer. You know, and he was like within dope slap distance of us, and <laughs> and he would, uh, and there was a phone. Remember the old phones with the buttons lit up? Yeah. Well, the phone was silenced, but we could see the buttons flashing. Right. And of course, for about the first nine weeks we did the show, Tommy and I, and I kept asking, that, "That the one we're supposed to answer, number two? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and we just took the calls in the order in which they came, so there was no production involved. You know. And at at the very start, uh, did you? Um have names for the, for the, say, for the engineer? I mean, did you credit him as John yeah, Smith or as yeah, yeah, I believe John so. the... Yeah, I, I, I believe so, maybe. No, the whole name... John the thing. Cat Burglar Smith or something. I mean, yeah, yeah. No, that came later. That, that was, came later. That was with Dr. DeFranza. Oh, all the, all the funny names, you know, yeah. but we used to credit the real engineer who was there. I yeah. Mean, well, well, let me ask Doug, because um, I, I associate two uh, names with you, really. One was uh, Not a Slave to Fashion, which people, <laughs> you know... <laughs> <laughs> and we people can make their own judgments. <laughs> make, people, this is, you can judge for yourself. I'll, I'll have you know this is this is formal wear in California. <laughs> <laughs> and Subway Fugitive. And uh, I just like you to explain what that one's about. Well, that was when I uh, I was actually at NPR. People may not know that I had a legitimate career before yeah. this. You were on a path I, to an honest life. I was on a yeah. path yeah. to an actual journalistic <laughs> career that I could be proud of. We derailed uh, that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I I, I may have his parents. I had gone to 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 NPR to do a week's worth of work on some project. I don't remember what it was, and they put me up somewhere in you know, Dupont Circle. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful fall day, and I went and got myself an enormous decaf at this brand new coffee place that was, I think, called Starbucks <laughs> at the time. And I got on the subway. I got down to the subway. And Don't forget to mention the muffin. I didn't have a muffin. <laughs> it's just coffee. That's, that's slander. Uh, and I'm standing there waiting for the, for, the, for the subway to come, and a woman walks up, kind of plain, plain outfit of some kind. She's got a canvas bag. She said, sir, you're not allowed to drink that coffee in here. I said, oh, sorry. Thank you for letting me know. Ignored her and, and kept drinking because I figured she was just a good Samaritan. And she comes over and she puts so there were signs all over that said no eating and drinking <laughs> in any of the stations. In the there might have been. I didn't see them. 
Yeah. And she pulls out a badge. She was an undercover, undercover food food detective cop. in the uh, uh, Washington. <laughs> and she said, I'm going to have to write you up. And I, I said, really? And she goes, absolutely, sir. And she said, there's no eating or eat drinking on the metro. I said, gee, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. I, you know, uh, she said, let me see your license. And she takes my license. She takes out her ticket book and starts filling everything out. <laughs> so I say, while you're doing that, would you mind if I finish my coffee? <laughs> I wasn't trying to be a smart ass. I really want it to still full. And she said, no, sir, then I'd have to take you in for continuing to perpetrate the crime. <laughs> and I said, you're kidding me. She said, I am not kidding you, sir. <laughs> so we, I, we don't kid in the... We don't kid in the metro. In the metro, the the subway, food. food police. So she's writing me up for this ticket. I don't know, it's citation of some kind. And at that moment, a guy in a three-piece suit walks by on the uh, platform eating an, an apple, a green apple. And she catches him out of the side, like the corner of her eye. And it's like, it reminded me of my dog when there are two tennis balls. And, then, <laughs> yeah. and so she says, she says, wait right here. And she goes, sir, you can't eat that in here. And the guy goes, ah. She goes, Sir, you're going to jail. And she whistles, and another guy comes running down the platform, and they're collaring this guy up. And I'm watching this, and the train shows up. <laughs> and I, I don't really have a criminal nature, but I don't know what came over me. I grabbed my license, and then I grabbed all four copies of the ticket. And I got on the train, and I stood there with my heart pounding, waiting for the doors to close. And they closed. And I went to NPR, and I called my wife, and I was... Repentant? Rushing. No, I was, I was terrified, actually, that I had done something terrible. And we laughed about it, and I said, now, whatever you do, don't tell the guys. And so she hung up and immediately called them. And. Uh, by the next week, I was the, he subway, was the subway fugitive forever. Exactly. <laughs> there was a little, another little piece of this little story. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were in D.C. for some NPR event, huh. and I think Bugsy and Tom and I arranged to have a policeman go to Doug's hotel room. <laughs> 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 Just, <laughs> Just to see if he could make a joke. <laughs> They've had about 25 years of fun with this. Yeah. Yes, you've... Uh, I hope the statute of limitations is Well, that's, has, uh, I argued that the, the statute of limitations is <laughs> up, but they, has, they claimed that they looked into it and it doesn't expire if I've left the jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> the clock starts again when you return. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, was this an activity that you, and, that, that you and Tom would do to think up the names for people? To I don't know where that actually came from. I think it might have come from Doug's wife, Zip, I think. So, but in his case, but generally, I mean, did uh, you... It was, yeah, it was Dr. DeFranza, because this guy... We, we, well, we did start with water pistol fights. I mean, there, we were kind of a juvenile crew, right. you know, you know so. okay. <laughs> There was a guy who wrote a... Tom read a piece on the air, which was about smoking and driving and why smoking and driving... Why smokers are worse drivers. Yeah. Remember this? Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was... A, I don't remember what the reason was. They're more risk taking or something like that. And, and yeah, let's. I, the piece about smoking and driving. Oh, we have that. Yeah, we have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have time for a few more calls. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want to oh. talk about this little note that John gave me here. Dr. Joseph DeFranza mm -hmm. did a study showing that smokers have 50% more automobile accidents and receive 46% more traffic tickets than non-smokers. Oh, I know the answer. It's obvious. Well, well uh, he, he speculates on what the answer is. I know oh, exactly no. the answer. Go ahead. What do you think? Well, if you were a smoker, you'd know. Because I'm not. I mean, I've my, I'm pure. <laughs> I can breathe better. <laughs> I can smell flowers. I know. When I, I eat more. When I, <laughs> I'm fatter. <laughs> when, I, when I used to smoke. And I'm dying for a cigarette. <laughs> when I used to smoke, a cause of great concern <laughs> Last week. was dr dropping a cigarette down between your legs <laughs> while you were driving. Especially when you park next to a bus. <laughs> no, we're, we're, and everyone's looking up. The window, wondering what the hell you're doing. No, worse than that is driving along at 60 miles an hour 
end. No, it's all right if you drop the whole cigarette. You got a shot at five minutes. But when the end of the cigarette should right fall off and fall down between your legs at sixty, you're done for. And you don't think that would cause you the speed? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's the end of the show for tonight. I can't go on. <laughs> uh, I'll, oh, I got it here. Dr. DeFranza says, Dr. I'm sorry. Dr. DeFranza says, I'm sorry for injecting such levity into an otherwise serious show. Smokers are less concerned about their health and are more likely to be reckless drivers. That's what Dr. DeFranza says. He's not. Can we take a call? Hello. You're on contact. I'm calling from Kansas. 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 Added Dr. DeFranza as our automotive medical researcher in the credits. <laughs> that was the start. And then after a few weeks of this, I started feeling nervous about it. That's, you see my role here. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, you know, this guy's got a professional career. We're making fun of his research. <laughs> eh. <laughs> Could be, you know. Yeah. I mean, research, right, you know, research. We, we could. This could be. Legal, it could be legal trouble. We should stop doing it. And you were. St you still have that NPR spirit, did you? Yeah. So. So anyway, we stopped doing it, and then a couple of weeks later, we get this. Sure enough, a big yellow envelope from DeFranza, mm -hmm. and then you open it up nervously, and it says, "Hey, why'd you stop mentioning my name at the end of the show?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, cigarettes. Cigarettes are are a far cry from. Uh, the hardware under the hood, but uh, I, I want to play one other clip, uh, which which illustrated how uh, the breadth of knowledge that you that you guys <laughs> brought uh, to questions that your that your caller rose. This is about hair. I want to know why, after five to six hours in the car, I always end up having a bad hair day, <laughs> and I know it's got to have something to do with you know something mechanical. What kind of a hairdo do you have? I have shoulder length hair. Shoulder length? And normally it's kind of, you know, naturally curly and yeah. has lots of body. And by the end of a car day, it, it looks frizzed. It, well, it's no. flat. It's flat. Like it's flat and not fluffy. Head. Flat and not fluffy? No. And do you have air conditioning in your car and do you use it? Yes. And is this problem worse in the summer than it is in the oh, winter? Oh, yes. Yeah, probably. Do you use a cream rinse? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you have a brand? Actually, what I want to know is if there's some like gadget I can buy for three payments of you know nine ninety five each that's going to cure this thing. Do you know of anything like that? Well, you I'm know, sure I'm sure Ron Pulpeel is, is working on right yeah, there. You know, right. I, I don't mean to laugh here, but this show started out. You mean today? No, no. In 15 general, fifteen years ago, this show started out with people calling us. With nuts and bolts questions. Well, What's the valve clearance? To, should the valves be hot or cold when I adjust them? And right. How do I talk the cylinder? How do I, have, I, I talk can't the, get the torque wrench in there because the firewall's yeah. in the way? And we have come now to bad hair. Aggressive. Hair. <laughs> I mean, and you're asking her to use a cream rinse, and I'm wondering, have I just parachuted in here <laughs> from some other planet? What the hell is going on? <laughs> Opportunity for you guys. You, know, you could invent something that could cure this problem. Do you use a cream rinse? Yes, I do. Well, you shouldn't in the summer. <laughs> no, it gives your hair too much body, <laughs> and it'll flatten sure. out. <laughs> what the hell do you know about cream rinse? <laughs> what is yeah, cream I rinse? I wanted a mechanical answer to this problem. I, I already knew. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have assembled, we've invited here uh, some of your, your uh, colleagues on, on uh, Car Talk, and I'd like right now to introduce one of them uh, who's going to contribute to this event. This is a person who might remember it from NPR as David Green, but he later became David Gibraltar Green. <laughs> David. <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to come up for a minute and just say that it was a joy working with these guys for 21 years. You don't. Check's already in the mail. Don't you, worry. You, <laughs> you, you, you do, you, it's hard to describe having a job where you, you go to work every day and laugh. It just, you, you just don't really appreciate it until you have it. But over the course of time, 
there was something that cast a dark cloud over it. Mm. Uh, and I've had a guilty conscience <laughs> about something. I need to clear my conscience. I, I need to apologize. Now? Yeah, I, I need to apologize for something. You can't do it unless the number is two. <laughs> See, that, that's Ray giving the answer to the puzzler, though I think it sounded a little different. Your voice was a little different when you were giving it on the air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And at the time, I was responsible for, for vetting puzzlers to make sure they were accurate. And uh, that was a math puzzler, and Ray gave the answer as two. And it turned out... There were many answers. <laughs> you, yeah, you could do it with a lot of numbers yeah. other than two. So first off, I apologize for missing that. Yeah, know, yeah. For, and <laughs> then I should have gone to you and told you quietly, you know. So you could have maybe gone on the air, given a little bit of a mea culpa. But Dougie, fi fired Dougie me. wouldn't let you do it, huh? <laughs> yeah, you could have fired me. But instead, I told Doug and he told Tom, and they decided that all four million listeners needed to be made aware of it. <laughs> And I spent about six hours in the studio getting that echo just right. <laughs> yeah. But I felt terrible about it ever since. Well, I, for, 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 well you should. I, I remember. Uh, <laughs> and I, I do remember when I gave the puzzle answer. I was so confident because of your competence uh, in this <laughs> area that I said, you can't do it unless the number is Two. I mean, it was authoritative. It, yes. Very authoritative. <laughs> <laughs> and very wrong. You cannot do it. Yeah, I also have to apologize because I sold about 75,000 ringtones of those back in <laughs> 2006. Thank you. Which thankfully is going to get me to retirement. So thank you. Oh. But, okay. you know, as of today, we're clear in the air, it, it's going away. Oh, you think that, so? Yeah, it will <laughs> never. Know you, it I know will, where you live. It will never again. It will never again <laughs> see the light of day. Okay. So. Oh. David Gibraltar Green, thank you very much for that. Um, I've been told, I've been told, Ray, that pranks were very common uh, uh, on the on the staff, and that the the uh, Montreal Hotel fire, for example, uh, was one that ranked. Oh yeah, yeah, that was. Uh... <laughs> so I, I dragged my my wife and our kids to Montreal for a weekend. And, one of my favorite cities, especially in the summertime. And, and uh, our younger son, Andrew, was, uh, what's the right word for it? A terror. <laughs> and he was almost two years old at the time, but he, oh my God, he was terrible. And so to start the story, we had been in a, into a, a, an arcade where our older son wanted to go. You know, you throw a quarter in the machine, you play a game. And, and the little guy wanted to play, but he didn't have the necessary skills. But I gave him a few quarters. And when it, after he'd gone through a couple of bucks worth of quarters, they said, well, it's time to go. And he resisted, and he dug his little, little baby fingers, dug his fingers into that console, and he said, no. <laughs> and so I peeled him out, and we were out on St. Catherine Street with people walking by, and he now dug those fingers into my forearm, <laughs> and he says, remind me, I, when he, how old was he, 20, 21 months or something? Yeah. 21 months. He says... Kill Dada. <laughs> hate, hate Dada. I don't know where he even got these concepts. He's, he's not even two. <laughs> Precocious kid. Anyway, we get back to the hotel after having a very difficult dinner at some restaurant, and I was just exhausted. And, and I don't know if Doug put my brother up to this or not, but I get a phone call in the room, Mr. Megaliosi. This is Henri. Uh, I'm from the, uh, from the hotel. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I'm the concierge. I said, yeah, what's the problem? He said, monsieur, did you used to own a green Ford LTD? I said, what do you mean used to own? <laughs> oh, monsieur, there has been a terrible fire in, in the garage. And, and he caught me at a weak moment. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. I said, what happened to my car? Oh, monsieur, this carbonisé is gone. And I'm trying to think, how am I going to get my family back and all those Cuban cigars that I bought? I was across the border. And he had me going for a good three or four minutes until finally he couldn't take it anymore and he started to laugh. I said, okay. <laughs> that was the great Montreal Hotel fire. <laughs> 
did you used to own? <laughs> okay. We're going to hear from another one of your Car Talk colleagues, uh, Louis Cronin, known to all of us as Louis the Barbarian Cronin. All right, so um, you all remember at the end of the show when they'd say, you know, box 3500, you know, Car Talk Plaza, Harvard Square. And our fair city. Our fair city. <laughs> so we used to get a lot of mail in there. And I mean, it could range anywhere from, you know, uh, a puzzler answer to uh, uh, a coconut to um, oh, yeah. oh. a box of baked goods. So one time, we get this box of baked goods from this woman who had invented these baked goods, and they were called Bruffles. And she, they, she had made them up, and they were half brownie and half, half truffle, chocolate truffle. So, you know. I never saw any of these. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, so we had them in, this, in, you know, at Car Talk Plaza waiting to go to the show and give them to Tom and Ray. But the box kept calling to us, and they sounded so good. So we, we just thought we'd try one, and they were delicious, unbelievable, best thing we'd ever had. So then we all tried one, and then, you know, we started picking at it and having seconds. And finally, I was there, like, the last night before the show, and I looked at the box, and there was one left. Oh. So I ate it. Of course. <laughs> So, but being an Irish Catholic, I, I was consumed with guilt. So I sent the Bruffles lady an apology and said, your Bruffles were so delicious that we couldn't stop. We ate every one. And could you please, please send us another box and we'll give them right to Tom and Ray, we promise. So, unbeknownst to me, <laughs> the Bruffles lady had already emailed through the website to our website producer, Car to, um, Doug Mayer. She said, so how did the guys like the Bruffles? Oh, uh. And <laughs> Doug said, they love them. <laughs> <laughs> so the Bruffles lady was really, really angry. <laughs> she sent us an email saying, in my day, people did not open mail that was not addressed to them. <laughs> And, you know, I thought, well, you never worked at Car Talk Plaza. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, you never knew what we would get. We'd get, like, bottles of vampire blood wine, you know, boxes of rusted car parts. Um, we got, like, a relic from the moon landing at one end. Anyway, so uh, Doug Mayer decided, in a very Car Talk way, that he would deal with this problem head on. So he wrote to the Bruffles lady and he said, I'm so sorry about the confusion, but I gotta tell you the truth. We can't leave any food in, this, in the office with Louie around. <laughs> <laughs> threw you under the bus, he eh? Threw me under the bus, yes. Whoa. Luckily, the Bruffle lady felt sorry for me and sent us another box of Bruffles. And this time, they were well sealed. Here, here. Do you, have, do you ever have any of these? I never did. <laughs> did I? So, we ate them at the studio. We ate them right here at BUR. Yeah. I must have been out that day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a theme emerging here. Between, yeah, confession. Uh, <laughs> between Louis the Bruffle Thief uh, and uh, the subway fugitive here. Yeah. Uh, there's a certain theme of, you know, kind of a, a wildness. Uh, and uh, there was one moment on, the, on, on Car Talk that I love that, that, uh, that gets to the same point. This was about um, a, a, a toll gate. Do we, do we have that yeah. queued up? And, okay, I take a bridge to work every day, and they charge $2 to get across this bridge. So um, I have my $2 ready, and I'm, I'm waiting in a toll line that's like, you know, 15 cars long or something. And at the last minute, I realized that I'm in a coins-only lane. Ah. It was also a toll lane where, where one of those arm things comes down, so it's not like I can just go through it. So you're going to have to run the rapids, as they say. Exactly. Shoot the rapids. Exactly. Oh, when the guy, sneak, when sneak the guy in on the front other guy's of you, green light. Yeah. 
So I waited until the guy in front of me threw in his whatever, 300 quarters or whatever, and when that arm thing went up, I You went, floored it. I floored it. I went through it. <laughs> Buzzers went off. There was mayhem everywhere. Well, will they come get me? Is there any way they can get my address for my license? See, what bridge is it? We can find out. Um, it's it's called the Betsy Ross Bridge. Oh, it's the Betsy. It's 95. Bets- okay, it seems to be run by the Delaware Port Authority. We have them on the phone? You've got to be kidding me. Oh, my God. You're not going to believe me? this. Hold on a minute. We're not giving him your name. Oh, okay. You evidently, Doug and Ken <laughs> have just somehow gotten a hold of who? <laughs> Dawn, somebody who's the bridge manager. Hello, Dawn. Hello, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is cruel. Oh, my goodness. I really w- I was ready to pay the $2, and I didn't Yeah, sure. Change. Gail, we chased you for four miles. <laughs> Gail, you need to stop. No, wait a minute. Dawn, who are you really, Dawn? I'm the bridge manager at the Betsy Rose Bridge. You really are? I really am. And oh, if, we, if we don't get this $2 fast, we might have to close this bridge up. <laughs> Who, who knew that the bridge manager could improvise like that? Who knew? What that? timing, huh? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Well, that was the advantage of taping the show. Yeah. You know, that we could, that, you know, when somebody called, we'd have the chance to do a little research. Yeah. You know, when this woman divulged it was the Betsy Ross Bridge and all that, it set these two guys right to work immediately. <laughs> but but you, you knew that was coming, didn't you? No. You didn't know that was coming. Well, they never knew anything was coming. <laughs> no. no it's, it's, Wasn't it obvious? It's, it's your, <laughs> they didn't... It, they, just, it was they, the impression I had, but I thought that no, was they, a tribute to your skills. And they never want to know anything. No. Because they, 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 what Tom said was, if we know what's coming, then we'll be obligated to know the answer. <laughs> exactly right. You know, so they, 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 they insisted on being kept in the complete dark. Ignorance. And it, and, and ignorance. It was the theme of the show. <laughs> that's, why, that's why Louis didn't want to tell him about the Bruffles. Cause right. <laughs> Need well, to know basis. Uh, we're going to have another colleague of yours right now, uh, Ken Ken Rogers, uh, whom is, is Ken, whom I heard of all those years as Ken Babyface Rogers. Herman, I hi. So nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to take it in a different direction and more of an origin story, my origin story. So 34 years ago, almost to the day, I got my dream job out of college. And on the same day, I got a telephone call from WBUR. Oh. <laughs> and they were, offering, they were offering part-time work at the whopping rate of $8.50 an hour. Weekends, mostly Saturday nights, a little bit of Sundays. And I thought, well, the dream job, it's going to be great for about six months working at the used record store. But, <laughs> There really probably aren't any future prospects there, and I have no idea what the future prospects are working at WBUR, but something led me in that direction, so I said yes to WBUR. So I start work there. What I really want to do is what they're doing at the time, which was recording classical music, doing radio drama, a bunch of other things, which is something I had a little experience in, didn't do any talk shows. And I chased that for about six months. And I thought I was getting closer, thought I was getting closer, yeah. more hours. Yeah. No. So then one day, my boss, David Green, pulls me aside. And David's office back in those days, BUR was not the lovely place we're uh, enjoying tonight. It was a bunker. Would that be the best way to describe <laughs> it? Cinder block bunker. Right? Cinder block bunker. It, was, it had a real prison vibe to it. <laughs> and David shared a corner of a hallway with another guy, Mark Navin. Um, and David pulled me aside and said, the car talk engineer is leaving. And I'm thinking at that moment, car talk, that's the show that's on Sunday nights. Yes. So I hadn't heard car talk yet. I'd been there a while focusing on something else. Mm-hmm. And the engineer's leaving and you're going to be the new engineer. And it pays eight seventy five dollars an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the other direction. I think it was less. <laughs> but, and at that moment, I was, I was sure that was a demotion because I wanted to record classical music and do these other things. And so I sort of resigned myself to the fact that I'd be moving on at some time in the near future. And then I got to actually sit in on the show and experience for the first time. And I think I, they let me have it a second time before they put me in charge. Um, and I loved it. 
and I had such a good time. It was such a complete departure from everything else, which was fine, that be where I was doing at the time, that it just brought me right in, and all of this story is in service of is to say thank you. Well, you shouldn't have you quit. Oh. You should have quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I, I have quit a few times. Sorry about that, but, you know. But Ken's back in the fold now. I have to tell a quick little story about Ken. Please. Uh, I think I'd mentioned earlier that for some reason, Tom and Doug and I had engaged in some water pistolery. Uh. <laughs> and and uh, it, it escalated. Uh, and it got pretty bad at some point. It's, uh, like Ken mentioned, the, the, the old WBUR was an, an awful place with people you know, sitting in hallways and desks you know, made out of you know, cardboard boxes or whatever. <laughs> and, but we didn't manage to secure a conference room for about an hour a week, where we would work on our newspaper columns, such as it was. Hmm. And, and uh, unbeknownst to me, there was something really nefarious going on. And Ken came in. You may not remember this. Oh, I remember this. <laughs> and, uh, I remember this. I was, the, it was a very pivotal moment in my career. I think it was the first time I quit after that. It might have been. <laughs> so he, he comes and he says, you have to sign these papers and whatever. And I didn't know what the hell he's talking about. But I look at the papers, and, and one of them says, Doug has a super soaker water gun taped to the underside of the table where he's sitting. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, okay, Ken, thanks, great, you know. So, so I, I, I kept plying Doug with, hey, Doug, have some more water, you know. I figured he'd have to pee sooner or later. <laughs> and, and he finally had to leave the room, and at which point I removed the super so soaker from under the table. <laughs> and when Doug came back, it was, the look on his face was great because he, had a sense that something was amiss, and he was doing this underneath <laughs> the table and not finding his, and he turned to me and that looked like, oh no! <laughs> and, right out of the Godfather, too. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. The gun behind the And I, I chased him through all the little corridors in the, in the, in the <laughs> station, and uh, we got in a lot of trouble for that. I don't know, who was the station manager then? Was it Jane? Yeah, yeah it had to be, huh? Jeff Hutton. Jeff Hutton was the... Uh, oh, he would have, he would have been... A, it's, Doug would have been on my ass for giving you guys the evidence about the super soaker and whatever happened, Jeff Hutton was my other boss. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as long as you want to get... So I, uh, all I had to do was quit. That's all. That's yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you. Uh, Ray, was it this much fun at the garage? No, uh, no not, at, not at all. As a matter of fact, I, I used the show as a release. Uh -huh. I mean, the garage was stressful. You know, the beauty of the show is we'd give people answers, and, and whether they were wrong or right, it hardly mattered. Uh, <laughs> yeah, until that other damn thing that Doug dreamed up, the stump the chumps thing. We'll get to that in a minute. But, yeah. but we, you know, we would give answers to people. But at the garage, we, we had to shoot for perfection. Yeah. We never achieved it, but we shot for it, you know. <laughs> it's, it, it's rare that someone says, he didn't fix my car, but he was very entertaining. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> it's not a natural reaction. That's something you see on the review exactly. sites very much. Exactly. <laughs> but Stump the Chump was a, was a Berman uh, yeah. idea, Stump the Chumps? I think so. Yeah, it was, it was him and Cronin. No. Before you? Before, yeah. He was? Really he was? Yeah, well, he, he figured he was going to embarrass you. <laughs> Bastard, I never knew that. Because <laughs> Ray was always very authoritative when he gave the answer, mm -hmm. which is a great quality, until somebody checks on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did pretty well, all, all things considered. And I will admit... Oh, oh. oh. That these people who purport to be friends and former producers, or former, <laughs> now former friends, <laughs> went out of their way to find the calls that I was most likely to have made a mistake on. They wasn't, wasn't uh, very nice. It wasn't that hard, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Well, we're going to hear from another one of your purported friends and former ex, ex -friends, yeah. uh, colleagues, Carly Nix, uh, also known as Carly High Voltage Nix. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, working at Car Talk was my first real job um, out of college <laughs> uh, as well. And so I guess this is an origin story also. Um, so my first real job uh, taught me a lot about uh, what to expect in the office place. And um, 
Uh, Doug told me uh, when he hired me that uh, he was ruining my resume and my career. And I thought that he was joking. <laughs> but uh, working at my first job, I learned such things as there should be a nap couch in the office in case you need to sleep at work. Uh, all the employees should be able to sleep whenever they want in the office. Um, I also learned that uh, work ethic means don't take yourself seriously or your work seriously. <laughs> and uh, I also learned that uh, the meaning of productivity in the office is that if you're getting too much work done, you should stop what you're doing and go drink cappuccinos with your friends in Harvard Square, for God's sakes. <laughs> and so uh, my, my career and my resume were thoroughly ruined by working at Car Talk. Um, so I wanted to say thank you. Uh, <laughs> Quite well. It was an honor. <laughs> but really, my, my career was ruined uh, by working at Car Talk because I got to work with the best and brightest people um, at NPR. And so I want to say thank you so Good much. <laughs> thank you. Did, did you and, and Tom enjoy it as much as these guys enjoyed working there? I mean, was oh, oh, good, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We it was fun. Certainly did. It was fun going to work. <laughs> it's really, I, it, I, I was almost embarrassed to take the money. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> You mean how much you enjoyed work? <laughs> it was. It was a great time. I mean, you ask anybody, you know, and they'll tell you, like, whenever we were together with Tom and Ray, we were all laughing, you know? It really is true. I, I uh, always told people when they asked about, and I must say, the, 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 uh, it was much more impressive to my kids, to my now adult kids, uh, to hear it, when I came up in the rotation that, uh, and even though uh, when, Ro when uh, he hears that Robert Siegel wished he had gone to dental school and said, <laughs> this is national, whatever, whatever, it used, is that, 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 that was much more impressive uh, to my kids than whatever I was doing Monday through Friday on. Sad, isn't it? And all that it, is, it, is, uh, it gave me it was much, more, much more street cred that, uh, uh, that, I, that I could say that. Um, did uh, to tell me about your relationship working with with your brother? I mean, did you guys? I know you were always. Whenever I met you, you were exactly as you were on the air. I mean, every conversation mm -hmm. I've had, it was the same. It was as if uh, the mic was off, but but the show went on. Yeah, um, and I think that started from having dinner at the same table every night. You know, I mean, even though Tom was twelve years older than me, I mean, yeah. and he was a big influence on me in a lot of ways. We did. When I got to be six, I think, you know, Tom would, would have been 18, you know, and wow. well, that's, that's a big gap, but he was an incredible big brother. Yeah. We, we did, he did a lot of stuff with his little brother. I think mostly to see how much voltage they could put through me, you know. <laughs> 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 you, but our dinner table was always infused with laughter and jokes and stories. It was, you know, and I, I assumed that everyone's dinner table was like that. And then I got invited to friends' houses, and I realized that people just sat there and ate the dinner <laughs> and didn't speak. But, you know, the dinner was secondary. We ate our dinners, but it was secondary. You know, the, the, the sharing of stories and just laughs was very important to us. We have, uh, we have one other clip that I would like to play, and uh, because it was about your, uh, about your family. You have any questions for Mom? Well, I'd like to know from her which of you she likes best. Yeah, I want to know that, too. <laughs> After looking at all your children, I don't know if you have children. Yeah, Linda's got children. You have children, Linda? Uh, no. No, Linda doesn't have children. Fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Linda's lucky. <laughs> did you really say fortunately? She did. I did. <laughs> she did, sure. Well, you know, in this day and age, that's a good answer. <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> Linda, get up to putty up those doors. You'll be all right. Just, oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely. She was funny. Lizzie was funny. Yeah, she could be very stern at times, but she was, for the most part, pretty funny. And the fact that she allowed us to call her Lizzie, was, I thought, was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, um, were there kinds of questions about cars 
that you just decided we're not going to, you know, I, I don't want that on the show. You know, that's well, Tom, like Doug said, Tom and I had no, nothing to do with that. I mean, he yeah. was the one. He and Louie and Ken, whoever else, Carly, whoever else worked on the on the show, Catherine. I mean, there was a whole host of people. So they'd say the they shampoo, shampoo was in the, uh, you know, the. Yeah. The, so we never, ever had any idea what was coming next. I think I think these guys could probably speak more to this, but uh, you know, I think what we were looking for when we were screening calls is like, will Tom and Ray have fun with this person? Mm -hmm. You know, that was sort of the, the first criteria. You, you remind me of how I um, uh, how I came to appreciate what I thought was great about about your program, which was that uh, there are a lot of programs where people in the studio talk with people who phone in about sports, about politics, and typically the the phone call is a, is a, the talking with the people is a pretext to talk more about sports, or talking mm -hmm. uh, with the people is a pretext for talking about about politics. But I, I always felt that talking about cars was a pretext for talking with people. Exactly. For, and for hearing people talk about real life and these, these, uh, the, our, our relationship to this strange thing that was the second biggest purchase we'd ever made in our life after a house, mm -hmm. uh, and that was, was baffling in some way uh, to, uh, to a lot of us. And it, it worked incredibly well. I mean, I... I well, I'm we enjoyed talking things. about talking to people. We didn't enjoy the cars as much as we yeah. might have hoped. You know, and once in a while, when we knew the answer, it was like, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for the most part, while Tom was entertaining himself, mostly, yeah. <laughs> and the caller, I was, you know, racking my brain trying to figure out some kind of an answer so we could yeah. move on to the next caller. <laughs> I think the subway fugitive here, once I'm, I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to take advantage of an, an old confidence. I think he once told me that if you listen very, very carefully uh, to who was answering what questions <laughs> in what way, you could figure out which of the brothers, <laughs> which of the brothers was putting in work to actually understand the cars, <laughs> and which of the brothers was there mostly along for the ride and the laugh. Uh, he told me that if I ever said this in public, he'd kill me. <laughs> he, he, he would, he would Too deny late it. now. <laughs> I figure We're all confessing these days. It's, it's been a long time. Uh, Tom, Tom played an important role. He, he helped stall while Ray thought of the answer. <laughs> well, Tom was a, uh, he, he was a very special person. And um, we're going to hear a story about, about your brother right now from one of your uh, former colleagues. This is uh, from Catherine <laughs> Frau Blucher. Penalosa. Um, so I basically, I'm going to try and get through this. I like being behind the scenes, so oh. bear with me. Too bad, yeah. yeah. Um, I basically grew up on the show. Um, I was hired a year out of college. The guys saw me date my now husband. They saw me get married. And um, I would sort of leave the show for a little bit and I'd get pulled back in. Um, and I had left the show for a little while, I was working on another show at the station and we were expecting our first child. And the baby was due actually right almost on Tom's birthday at the end of June. So he decided this baby needed to be named Cosmo, <laughs> which was an uncle. There was their family member named Cosmo. Oh, grandfather. Grandfather. Yeah. So every time I'd see Tommy, he would say, how's Cosmo? And he'd get all excited. So um, at a routine doctor's appointment, we found out that there was a problem. And within 12 hours, our son was born. And um, he had a spinal tumor, a cancerous tumor. And um, we didn't have time to tell anyone. We told our parents, and that was it go to the hospital, our son Henry, not Cosmo, <laughs> is um, immediately transferred to Children's, and my husband goes with Henry, and I'm sitting on the you know, maternity floor with um, rooms all around me listening to babies, and I'm by myself, until I hear laughter. <laughs> I don't know how right. he found me, but he found me, and I'm sitting in the hospital bed, and I hear the laughter getting closer and closer and closer. And Tommy pops in the room, and he says, where's the kid? <laughs> I got to meet him. And I said, well, Tommy, I can't, you know, I've had a C-section. I'm in this hospital bed. The nurses wouldn't let me go anywhere. And he says, 
hang on. <laughs> he leaves, he gets a wheelchair, he comes back, he says, kid, we're doing this. He gets me out of the hospital bed, into the wheelchair. The nurses are too shocked to say anything. <laughs> he wheels me from the Brigham, there's like a series of tunnels and, and sky bridges, and we end up at the um, NICU, the intensive care unit, which was very strict, it was only immediate family. And so they see this guy with like, that's like massive beard, like a little jelly donut hanging from the corner of his beard. And um, they look at him, I'm in a hospital gown, and they're like, what the heck's going on? And Tom looks the nurse straight in the face, who's guarding the door, and he says, I'm the father. <laughs> They didn't know what to say. They let us in. <laughs> and um, Tom just sat there. I mean, you can see, his, like, he just sat there and held our son Henry forever. Um, and I think, you know, and then Tom uh, ran his wife, no, Monique, through Ray, uh, uh, through Henry, a, a birthday party when he turned one. Um, but I think what I felt working on the show was that it was family. And I think that's probably what you guys felt. Um, that it wasn't just a show and it wasn't about laughing and it wasn't just about car repair. You felt, which is what we all felt, that we were part of something really special. And that when people would ever ask me, what is it like? What are they really like? And I'd say, that's what they're really like. <laughs> this is them. And it it's their get heart. Than that, no. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> and I, I just was remembering when someone was telling a story, I remember one time we had a caller, you know, the callers would be queued up and on hold, but they could hear the call ahead of them. And in between the calls, sometimes Tom and Ray, the language would get a little so salty. <laughs> and we had a priest on hold. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it just, it was a true pleasure and it, it truly is family. And I think we all, we all feel that as being part of this community. How old is Cosmo now? Okay, he's 16. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ray, what, what's next? What are you going to do next? What, uh... Well, I, I don't know. I, I tell you the truth. When the, when the show ended, I was kind of taken aback. I didn't even know what to do. In fact, uh, I thought that B a bigger reaction to the announcement that the show is not going to be aired anymore. And I thought, quite honestly, I drove my car down here and I circled the station a bunch of times looking for the, the <laughs> protesters, you know, with the, the, the pitchforks and the, and the torches, but there were none. You know? 44 years. I know, I know. Well, I don't have any, any immediate plans, okay. you know, but you, you never know. You never know. You never know. And sometimes you, you didn't know. No, most of the time. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to thank all of the Car Talk staffers who've, who've, who've joined us. The, 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 and and I, I, not everyone has spoken, so let me just thank all of those who have and haven't spoken this evening. Uh, Jay Clayton, Louis Cronin, whom we heard from. Uh, Catherine uh, Fenelosa, whom we just heard from. David Green. Don Jennings. John Bugsy Lawler. Hey. Bugsy! Jennifer Jiffy. Loeb. <laughs> Jennifer Jiffy Loeb. Stand up. Uh, Michael Melford. Carly Nix, whom we've heard from. Ken Rogers and Shea Zeller. And these are the only ones that we could get for tonight who aren't serving some kind of a sentence. You know? <laughs> yes, thanks. Well, thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, thanks to you guys and Doug and Ray. Uh, thank you for decades of fabulous radio and making NPR a, a much better place for your having been, having been part of it. And congratulations. Well, we can say the same thing to you, Robert. Thank you for coming here. Does, Thank you for decades of fabulous radio. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm handing it off to Amy McDonald. I don't know what to say, Amy. Uh, Thank you for coming. The premier ticket people, state, quote, and everybody else, you can head out. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone ought to stay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, Robert, thanks so much.